thank you very much, Nina, for inviting me. I feel honored to be part of this conference because you have built up a center of excellence um, about Kant in Russia. And so the city, the universities, they're well known because you build up the Kant Center in Kaliningrad. And so if we celebrate Kant's birthday today, you made the most wonderful gift by building up um, excellence, academic excellence in Russia and Kant studies in Russia. So um, it's wonderful to be here. I want to talk about today about um, the challenge of the Club of Rome. So the question is, why should we almost 300 years after Kant's birth, why should we still study Kant? And the main question is, of course, is Kant still relevant or is he part of an old enlightenment that should be replaced by a new enlightenment? There's a second question which you can ask is, um, is so to speak, is there still something new to say about Kant after 300 years? This was actually the question my mother asked me when I came to visit. It's kind of, how can you say something new? And I think Martin Sticker's talk tomorrow is a wonderful example how one can do both. So in a way, Kant is still relevant for us today. And in a way, there's still something new to be said about Kant. And so um, of these two questions, I want to focus about is Kant still relevant today? And the Club of Rome, they make three charges. I put it up on a handout. I hope I can share. So the three charges are basically that the old enlightenment and Kant as a major part of the old enlightenment promotes an individualism that neglects social ties. It promotes a rationalism that leaves out cherished traditions and long-standing values. And it lacks a, and it lacks a balance between on the one hand reason and on the other hand um, sensibility, nature, feelings and so forth. And so one could respond to this challenge in different ways. One way would be to say that maybe the Club of Rome isn't right in its aim, but I want to go a different route today and just say even if for the moment we grant that the Club of Rome is right and promotes important values, I would say that Kant is not the right target for these attacks. And so I want to go through, I want to go through those objections one by one. And so the first thesis is basically that Kant's philosophy does not promote an individualism in the sense of leaving out community, leaving out social ties, leaving out our interconnectedness with other human beings. So of course, Kant is often read this way and there might be ways in which we ourselves might read Kant this way. And this is the first um, point I put out in his political philosophy. Kant famously puts forward the three values of freedom, equality and independence. And this seems to be a reference to the model of the French Revolution, which was liberty, equality, and fraternity. So instead of fraternity, brotherhood, Kant seems to promote individualism and focus on the individuality and um, the single individual rather than the community. One could also think that in his moral philosophy, when Kant talks about autonomy, and he calls it the supreme principle of morality, that when he does so, he focuses on our conscious individual decisions. So these might be two aspects in which we believe that Kant does indeed promote um, an individualism and that the Club of Rome is right in his 
charge. But the point I would want to make is that um, our contemporary notion of autonomy, in which autonomy is a conscious choosing, it's a little bit like a New Year's resolution, a resolution you might make at the beginning of a new year to exercise regularly, to to um, um, see your friends more often or something. And um, Kant's view of autonomy is not this, it's not a conscious choosing, it's about the source of the moral principle in pure reason. It's also not about my personal private ends. I put it down, autonomy abstracts from all content of private ends. And it also, it's not like um, just I'm dictating based um, on my ends, I'm choosing one thing today, another thing tomorrow, but it's importantly, you give laws, but you give them universally. And all three aspects are important and speak against an individualism because it's not a conscious choosing as in a New Year's resolution. It's not that I choose based on my private ends where I could choose something immoral. Why should, um, if I consciously choose an immoral action, why should this be um, in a way something that is the ground of morality or the supreme principle of morality? And so the charge is often by Parfit and Stratton Lake that if I declare a law for everybody, then I undermine their authority and their autonomy. But since I'm not basing it on my private ends, I'm abstracting from private ends. In this um, sense, I'm not undermining somebody else's autonomy. So Kant's notion of autonomy would be misunderstood if it's read to be promoting an individualism. It's also famously, this ties in with Kant's maxim in his theoretical and especially religious philosophy is his maxim that we should think for ourselves, we should think consistently, but very importantly, we should think in community with others. And this is again on the screen um, on the handout from what is orientation and thinking, but we also get it in Kant's third critique. And so the complete determination of morality of moral requirements for Kant, this is the next quote, leads to a kingdom of ends, a systematic union of rational being. And in this sense, um, I would first say that the charge that Kant promotes in individualism is not quite correct. But what is more importantly is also that Kant positively can be an inspiration for us today. This is a quote from Derek Parfit. Um, he talks about the groundwork and he says, the truth is that in the cascading fireworks of a mere 40 pages, Kant gives us more um, new and fruitful ideas than all the philosophers of several centuries. So if we think about our contemporary moral philosophy, for instance, we think about dignity, autonomy, not using somebody merely as a means, we think about respect, we think about universal law. And Kant wasn't necessarily the first person who came up with this, but he's still very much um, um, an inspiration. If we think about dignity, if we think about respect or autonomy, we still turn to Kant um, to get a better sense of our contemporary ideas. So I just put down three examples like um, on the metaphysics of agency, what it means to be an agent. We still look at um, autonomy in Korsgaard's work, for instance. Kant is cited, not always endorsed, but he's cited, he's a major inspiration 
in our discussion of human rights and human dignity, as for instance, James Griffin um, is a good example of, uh, he's not a Kantian, but when he talks about human rights, he still turns to Kant for an inspiration. And very importantly also for, um, when we look at what it means to respect a patient in a medical setting. So in biomedical ethics, um, the famous principle of Beauchamp and Childress, they still turn to Kant for the justification of respect and informed consent. So my response would be twofold against the Club of Rome. That first, um, Kant doesn't fall victim or the charge wouldn't be fair of individualism, but it's also that Kant positively can still be an inspiration almost 300 years after his birth. So I now turn to the thesis two, and I would say that Kant does not promote an unrestricted rationalism. And here's a charge by the Club of Rome would be that um, we just use reason to push forward and we disregard cherished traditions, um, long lasting values. And so um, we just put it all aside in order to steam ahead just by a cold calculating reason. And again, I would say that this charge is not true for Kant and I would turn to his theoretical philosophy. So this is a very opening of the first um, first sentence of the first preface of Kant's um, critique of pure reason. And even we Kantians often forget about it when we talk about um, freedom and talk about God and the soul, we start speculating as if we know what it is. But of course, Kant famously says, and I just read it out from the screen, human reason has a peculiar fate in one species of its cognition that it is burdened with question that it cannot dismiss, but it can also not answer since they trans trans transcend every capacity of human reason. So here Kant acknowledges on the one hand our thirst for knowledge. We want to push for ultimate answers um, for the final end. So in terms of our inner psychological life, that's the soul. In terms of the physical world, this would be freedom. In terms of combined to answer all the questions, this would be God. But at the same time, Kant doesn't promote a rationalism that um, rationality can just put aside all traditions and just give answers, but we are inherently limited in our knowledge of um, the soul of freedom and of God. And so I just put on the next quote, thus I had to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. And so this doesn't undermine longstanding traditions and cherished practices and values, but Kant inherently limits the reach of rationality. But it's not only that, again, there is negatively, so to speak, no conflict between Kant and the charge of the Club of Rome, but it's also that we can learn positively from Kant in his theoretical philosophy. And this partly also relates not just to the question of God, freedom, and the soul, but also to questions about what we can know about an outside world. If we look up brain studies and the booming field of neuroscience, we understand more and more that the brain filters what comes to our attention and actually positively constructs how the world appears to us. And the pioneer, the first who um, put this out is again, Immanuel Kant. So I put up the quote, famous quote from the preface. Up to now, it has been assumed that all our cognition must conform to the objects. 
but all attempts that have been made in this respect have come to nothing. Hence, let us try once whether objects must conform to our cognition. So we always assumed that basically there's a tree out there, you open your eyes and you try to represent the tree as it is. And if you look at uh, neuroscience and Kant tells us, it's not actually that we are merely passive observers, but we actually construct how the world appears to us. So also on the second charge, I would say not only doesn't Kant not fall, um, not only does Kant not fall victim to the charge, but we actually can positively learn something from Kant as we try to move ahead. So I think I still have time. So let me look at the third thesis. And this would be the charge that an old enlightenment and Kant visit does um, not promote a healthy balance between on the one hand reason and on the other hand sensibility. So the charge would be that there's a single-minded focus just on reason and rationality and it neglects human nature, empirical science, sensibilities, feelings, emotions and so forth. And again, I would say that the charge is not correct. And I cite the famous passage from B75 in the first critique. Without sensibility, no object would be given to us. And without understanding, none would be thought. Thoughts without content are empty. Intuitions without concepts are blind. And so, of course, we know Kant, we study Kant, because the rational side, the side of pure reason, had been neglected before him. There are rationalists who just put the emphasis on pure reason, but neglect the sensible side. And the great achievement of Kant was that he emphasizes the importance of both aspects. So he strikes a synthesis between reason and sensibility. And this would be the balance the Club of Rome would be looking for. And the point I want to make is that he doesn't only do this in his theoretical philosophy, but Kant also promotes a similar balance in his practical philosophy, in his moral philosophy. So in the groundwork, Kant says that the whole of morals needs anthropology for its application to human beings. And um, it's, there's a passage in the preface 389 where Kant basically says, look, um, partly it's for gaining access. You have to know about human motivation. It needs judgment when to apply these laws. But it's also important for deriving concrete duties for um, basically getting specific cognitions as we need sensibility for getting particular cognitions in the theoretical philosophy. If you want to cognize the tree, you need sensible input. So in order to derive the um, concrete duties from the categorical imperative, we also need empirical knowledge, which Kant calls anthropology. It refers to how he sometimes calls it universal human ends. And I just give an example of this here in the metaphysics of morals, where he actually derives concrete duties from impulses of nature. There are impulses of nature having to do with man's animality. And of course, we know from the religion 26 that um, they're not just ends of animality, they're ends of humanity, they're ends of personality as well. So Kant believes that there are certain impulses in nature. Through them, I continue in the quote, through them, nature aims at self-preservation, preservation of the species, 
cultivation of talents, social ties, and um, um, uh, um, developing your rational capacities and so forth. And he immediately derives the content out of this when you apply the categorical imperative. So the quote goes on, the vices that are here opposed to this duty of himself are murdering himself and so forth, um, drunkenness, gluttony, and so forth. So what is important is that the old charge that the categorical imperative is empty, Kant actually endorses in the Vigilantius lecture notes, he says, yeah, by itself, the categorical imperative is empty, but it is um, supplemented with anthropology. So like in the theoretical philosophy, we have form and matter, we have reason and sensibility, and this would be a balance. I point to the next quote, which is from the metaphysics of morals from the introduction to both parts. A metaphysics of morals cannot dispense with principles of um, application, and we shall often have to take as our object the particular nature of human beings, which is cognized by experience. This is to say, in effect, that a metaphysics of morals cannot be based on anthropology, but can still be applied to it. And so, again, when we read the groundwork and Kant emphasizes this, there's a need for once for pure rational philosophy, but this doesn't mean that this totally neglects empirical knowledge, anthropology, and sensibility. And so here again, Kant seems to strike a balance between reason and sensibility. And so in conclusion, I would say that um, not only are the charges not valid of individualism, rationalism, and the lack of balance, but Kant also, he gives us a framework for thinking for us today without trying to solve every problem that might come up in the future. How could Kant anticipate all future technologies and um, give a moral guidance on stem cell research or a cloning or a technology he couldn't actually envision? So we have to think for ourselves. And the point is not to look at Kant's empirical psychology. Kant had medical views at his times. In the anthropology, it seems he believed that as a human being, you have a sleep quantum over a course of a life. It averages out to about five hours of sleep per night. And so if you would sleep more, you actually shorten your life because you use up the sleep quantum. So the point is not to follow Kant's empirical science, but to look at our contemporary science, which tells us that the amount of sleep we need is more like seven hours, 50 minutes, but it empowers us to think for ourselves. While at the same time, um, he gives us a framework which we can avoid the pitfalls of um, a pure empiricism where we couldn't, so to speak, generate obligation or universal um, insight in knowledge. And on this note, I want to conclude and open it up for discussion. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Oliver, thank you very much. Коллеги, пожалуйста, вопросы. Вочих Казыра. Yes, so thank you very much. Can you hear me well? It's nice to see you again. Have you yeah. been? Hello. Okay. My, uh, I have a question because once um, I remember reading your 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 paper from from Kant's Studien. I think the paper was called the Kant's notion of dignity, if I if if I remember correctly. 
And, uh, and if, I, if I remember correctly, the conclusion of the paper, it was that actually Kant's notion of dignity is not so relevant for, uh, for, uh, for, the, uh, for the contemporary, for the modern understanding of dignity. I think you said in this paper that in the end of the day for Kant, what, is, uh, what, what has the absolute worth is the moral law and not the human being. This is, I think, what you, what you said in this, uh, in this paper. Uh, from Kant's Studien, and it seems like like something you know which which chimes with uh, with the Club of Rome and with the at least the charge of rationalism, for example, right? So did you did you change your 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 mind or or how would you comment on uh, on that on that? Thank you very much. Thank you. This is a very important question. So in the dignity paper, I basically the point is that um, like the notion of autonomy, we, um, we take Kant's notion nowadays of autonomy, of dignity, of respect, but we're not actually using Kant's own notions, but we're, we're reading autonomy in the text. And then we think, oh, I know what autonomy is. It's like a New Year's resolution. And so just because I choose something, it should be the ground of morality. I should have a right just because I chose this. And so I, in this paper you mentioned, I, I made the same point about dignity. Although Kant uses dignity and we use dignity, it doesn't necessarily mean the same as what we mean nowadays. And so um, nowadays we basically think it's an absolute inner value and because we have this absolute inner value, therefore I should respect you. And this is just, this raises a problem if you think about it. Kant on the one hand, he says all human beings should be respected. He also says that only a good will has absolute value. It's a famous opening of the groundwork, but he also repeats it in the third critique, like um, 400, um, 400 um, aid and um, so forth. So in this sense, it's, um, it's repeated in the third um, critique. It's not just a single isolated statement um, in the groundwork, but it's basically um, all human beings should be respected only a good will has absolute value, but not all human beings have a good will. This comes out not only in the religion, but also in the um, in 463, in the metaphysics of morals, where even a vicious human being deserves respect. And so my conclusion was just that we cannot simply take the contemporary notion of dignity and read it into Kant. Absolute value, so to speak, is not the reason why I should respect somebody. But Kant says in the Metaphysics of Morals 417, it's basically I should respect other, other human beings because I have the categorical imperative already in me. It rests on the categorical imperative. And so this might be an example how Kant still can be fruitful for us today. He helps us to think more deeply about our contemporary commitments about dignity and autonomy. Does this speak to your question? Yes, yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, Martin Stika. Yeah, hey, uh, great talk. Um, Great talk. If, if you have that as a paper, please do send it to me. I have to send, I have to assign it to for my students uh, who come with a lot of prejudices about Kant. And I think you're, you're doing a great job at dealing with, with a lot of them. And um, so one, one question, one comment. Comment just briefly, just, just to be fair to Parfit's take on Kant. I think the way the quote continues is that Parfit says the reason why Kant um, is so inspirational for us is because he's inconsistent, right? So um, th th there's that, that maybe Kant just you know, throws out all kinds of ideas, um, some of them really good, but it's, it's not clear that they all fit. Yeah. Um, now my, my question um, about your first point, um, I, I think you're absolutely right that Kant wants us to think for ourselves, but also with others. Um, but 
I'm, I'm not sure that it's such a great discovery in the sense that it's, it's almost trivial, right? I mean, it's obviously right. You know, sometimes people, you know, media, you know, have agendas, biases, and we should rather think for ourselves than listen to, you know, the public discourse. And sometimes other people have really good ideas and we should think with them. And I was wondering, is there any, does Kant provide us further help? Does he indicate when, you know, we should think for ourselves and when we should think with others? You know, is, is there more that we can get? More than just this very general, obviously true statement. Um, thank you. It is an important point because it seems that um, these three maxims are mostly applying to everything that cannot be given in sense experience. So it applies to God, freedom, and um, the soul. It applies to political questions. But um, it's not so much a context when we do physics and think about the composition of a tree or something. Um, in this sense, you might be guided by experiments and you might be guided by science, but um, the, the importance of it is that it's, in a way, it answers the charge that Kant promotes an individualism. It's not just that um, um, on God, on freedom, on the soul, on political question, just go your own way. And this would be the charge of the Club of Rome, but Kant seems to endorse that it's very important the exchange with others and um, the change of community. The, the perfect point um, is also important, is of course um, correct. So um, Parfit says this in the context of a claim by Rawls that the different formulations of the categorical imperative are equivalent. And um, Parfit rejects that and says, look, Kant gave us all these great ideas, but as you say, they're not always um, coherent. So um, they might just have a local use and you might speak about this tomorrow. So um, using somebody merely as a means might only apply in certain contexts, but not around uh, all around. And so better principle would be rational consent, but that too might not be the whole idea. And I differ from Parfit on that point. I believe that the formulas are meant to be equivalent. And you and I talked about it. If you really follow up what respect could mean, um, you, you might make this point tomorrow, but um, there are situations where I disrespect you, but you're not a means to my end and so forth. And the best answer I find is how you're not disrespecting somebody is if you're not making exceptions to universal laws. And this can cover cases where you're not supposed to jump a queue when you're waiting in line at a bus stop or at a bank. But I don't have to, as Stephen Darvel or some people would say, I don't have to go to everybody, shake their hand, look them in the eye and say, I go to the back of the queue because I respect you as an equal. And so, um, but the point about the community, the three principles, I just used it not to make a deep point, but in a way just to give some textual evidence that Kant doesn't promote a radical individualism. Thank you. Спасибо большое за ваш доклад. На самом деле это очень серьезные вопросы, в смысле актуальные для нас. И то, что ваша матушка спрашивала, что там нового у Канта. То есть повторить надо? Я хочу вернуться вот к вашему воспоминанию о вопросах вашей матушки о том, что нового у Канта. Любопытно, что вы отвечали. Но это действительно вопрос, который все время возникает. И мне кажется, проблема... То есть безосновность этого вопроса в том, что каждый раз мы заново отвечаем на него. Там, в отличие от науки, здесь ситуация другая в философии. 
Но я бы хотел вот в связи с этим обратиться к вашему одному из последних тезисов о том, что моральная философия, она независима от антропологии, но она должна возвращаться к антропологии и прикладываться к антропологии. Мне кажется, ситуация, в отличие от моральной философии с антропологией, изменилась за последние 200-300 лет. И изменилась таким образом, что во времена Канта антропологи антропологией занимались те же самые философы. Ну, более-менее за редким исключением. А сейчас это выделенная область, это область наук. И мне приходилось общаться и с эволюционными биологами, которые занимаются вопросами морали с психологами, нейрофизиологами, которые занимаются вопросами морали. Но они так думают, что они занимаются. С нейроучеными. И каждый раз возникает вот та же самая проблема. Коллеги, вы занимаетесь проблематикой, которая является традиционно проблематикой моральной философии, но вы не интересуетесь моральной философией. Вы реализуете в своих исследованиях ну, может быть, то, что получили в каком-то первичном образовании университетском или свои обыденные представления реализуете. Иными словами, я сталкиваюсь с тем, что, условно говоря, антропологи современные, которые выступают в лице эволюционных биологов или психологов, нейрофизиологов, нейроученых, они занимаются, этологов, они занимаются, обращаются к проблемам морали, как возникают моральные представления, как функционирует суждение, каковы нейрокорреляты моральных суждений и так далее. Но они не озабочиваются теми вопросами, которые, которые были вот в концентрированном виде выражены Кантом и связаны со спецификой морального мышления, морального суждения, мотивации и так далее. Нет ли у вас вот такого впечатления, что антропологи моральных философов не ждут. Спасибо. Um, I have to apologize. I learned Russian in school, but I, um, I, I, um, I can't understand the full question in Russian. Кратко, одной фразой. <смех> Ученые, а именно эволюционные биологи, этологи, психологи, нейроученые, то есть специалисты по нейронаукам, обращаются к изучению морали, как им кажется, и исследуют некоторые явления, которые релевантны моральному опыту. Oh, um... но, они, но они не э, заинтересованы в понимании э, морали, как ее понимают моральные философы. Um, um, sorry, I, I can't hear the translation. I'm now, I'm learning that there might be... You can choose in the Zoom the translation point. So I, I click on Russian, but I don't see a transcript of... I see the chat. I, it's a button next to record. Yeah, so I put it on Russian, but it, it doesn't come up as a... I don't see a written text. No, you, you, you have choose the translation uh, Uh, point and choose English. Yeah, so I put in chat. Now I can hear you. Now I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, now I can't. Sorry. Um. Yeah. So unfortunately, I'm I'm very grateful for your help. So. Um. Uh -huh. Но сейчас я могу говорить? Заслуга Канта. И это было завершением длительного движения развития ранее нововременной мораль... 
моральной философии раннего нового времени. Было в том, заслуга была в том, что он привел моральные определения к состоянию, представляющими нам предмет, а именно мораль, в его специфических проявлениях или сущностных проявлениях. Это, это было длительное движение в моральной философии нового времени, и это одно из достижений моральной философии нового времени. После этого в этом направлении шло движение и именно выяснение функциональной специфики морали. Как бы мы ее ни понимали, как нормативная регуляция, или форма суждения, или мотивация и так далее. Ученые, так называемые, я имею в виду ученые, моральные ученые, а именно ученые, эволюционные биологи или этологи, или психологи, все те, которые представляют сейчас то, что раньше называлось антропологией, они тоже обращаются к проблемам морали и, и действительно исследуют явления, которые коррелируют с тем, что философы называют моральным опытом. Но эти ученые, они не заинтересованы в моральной философии. Их не интересуют э, те определения морали, которые дают э, моральные философы. Их не интересует вот, э, э, мораль в ее специфических проявлениях. И вот из-за этого э, мораль в их э, представлении оказывается чем-то усредненным, аморфным. Мне не раз приходилось участвовать в дискуссиях с учеными, в частности, с эволюционными биологами, с психологами, с нейроучеными. Ну, конкретно я совершенно говорю. И в ответ на полемические высказывания они говорят, а, нас не интересует ваше понимание морали. Мы руководствуемся, мы оперируем тем пониманием морали, которое нам удобно. А то, что вы думаете о морали, ну, это не входит, это, мы не можем поставить это в виде эксперимента. И я вот возвращаюсь к вашему последнему тезису, когда вы сказали, что моральная философия, конечно, не зависит от антропологии, но она должна идти к антропологии. И у меня вопрос, а антропологи нас ждут? Антропологам интересна моральная философия? Um, Спасибо. Спасибо to both, to the question and um, to the translator. Thank you very much. This was very helpful. Yeah, so um, I, I don't disagree. I agree um, with the point, but it's also, it's important that we um, have to limit partly the research we are allowed to do in anthropology and in biology. So um, there shouldn't be bio labs on, on um, weapons research or something. And so in this sense, um, um, it's one question, what is right? And for this, we might need the insights of the sciences and of anthropology. But at the same time, morality can also restrict the kind of science we should be doing and we are allowed to do. And so to the first part, I, I also agree, but it's important. This was partly my reference to Wojtek's question at the beginning, the first one. It's Kant didn't necessarily invent the notion of dignity, autonomy, respect, and so forth. So dignity we find in Cicero, and part of the point of that paper Wojtek mentions is that Kant's notion of dignity on my reading is much closer to Cicero than it would be to contemporary notions which we find after 1945 and the atrocities of Nazis and so forth. And similarly, the notion of um, autonomy we find in the ancient Greeks, we find in the Bible and so forth. So Kant didn't necessarily um, invent the notions, come up with them in the first time. But if we now do research and science, um, we look to Kant to give us the right interpretation. When does the dignity and respect and autonomy, when does this restrict the biological research we do? And it should rule out 
weapons of um, or research on biological weapons and development of those. But so um, thank you very much for your question. I, I do not disagree. Thank you. I'll try to say it in English, okay? Нет, я не имел в виду этику науки. Я не имел в виду этические проблемы научных исследований. Я имел в виду, что ученые, допустим, эволюционные биологи начинают объяснять возникновение моральных форм поведения или моральных суждений даже. Или психологи, нейро, нейро, нейрофизиологи или нейропсихологи начинают исследовать моральные суждения. И они делают какие-то выводы. Но я как э, философ, я пытаюсь найти там что-то для себя интересное, чтобы поправить свои философские представления. Но в то же время я вижу, что их понимание морального оказывается обусловленным их обыденным опытом. У них нет опыта философского категориального осмысления этих самых явлений. И вследствие этого их выводы о морали оказываются, ну, скажем так, упрощенными. Они как будто бы выпрямляют все. И когда я говорю об этом ученым, ну вот в частности эволюционным биологам или психологам, с которыми у меня были дискуссии на эту тему, они говорят, ну ты понимаешь, вот твои философские представления, они не операционализируемы, они не укладываются в наши эксперименты, и поэтому мы не можем их использовать. И это я к тому, как нам бы, как обеспечить союз философов и ученых в исследовании морали. Для меня это очень актуальная задача. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, sorry if I misunderstood, but this is a part I do not um, disagree with. I agree with you that um, the, there is this problem. But let's think about this this way. So, evolutionary biology might tell us that we developed a sense of cooperation. If you, for instance, look at um, animal research by Franz de Waal or something. So, um, chimpanzees developed a sense of um, fairness, at least for themselves, not necessarily on behalf of third parties, but um, for themselves. And they might have um, developed a form of empathy, which Franz de Waal calls us two pillars of morality. But this is just in a way it's, um, so to speak, it's, it, we learned this over the course of evolution means it was beneficial for us to have this kind of morality. But if you're faced with a new situation like a tsunami, or if there's a meteor um, about to strike Earth, um, this morality might not still be the right answer for how we should behave in this situation. And so this is why when Kant believes as I would say that the categorical imperative is a priori, he's very clear that it doesn't mean it's not learned by evolution. In the groundwork, we find it in 425-26. In the first critique, it's um, B167 to 169. And the reason is just because this was conditioned on our particular situation. So if you grow up in an area um, where there are a lot of famine, your um, morality, which you learn by evolution, is to share food. This is how whoever did this survived, and this became ingrained in our genes. If you, if you grew up in an area that's plagued by tsunamis, the morality you developed is run first and come back later to look for survivors. So like on an airplane, put your own mask on first and then help others. And so in this sense, um, evolutionary biologists 
might explain certain ideas, like you said, the ideas we have nowadays and something, but it can't explain potential future dilemmas, what we should do if a meteor strike um, were to be imminent. And so um, their morality could only explain maybe the status quo, why we have some of our everyday beliefs, but they're not normative in the sense what Nietzsche would call the genetic fallacy or something. Just because they came from evolution doesn't necessarily make them valid for new situations. Thank you. Спасибо большое. Мартин Штикер, I... Yeah, hey, um, that's a follow up. So if anyone else wants to go first, that's that's fine. Otherwise, I'll just follow up, Oliver, if you don't mind. Um, so, yeah, sure. So point taken that you just, you don't want to make a uh, deep point, but just show that Kant clearly says things that are at odds with him being an individualist. I'm wondering though, um, to, to, to really drive home your point, wouldn't you have to show that Kant says what he says and also can have what he wants to have, right? Because in a way saying that we should reason with others is, is, is cheap, right? If, if you don't give an account of how that fits into your framework, right? Take as an example Kant's racism and imagine Kant somewhere in his works had said, Racism is very bad, right? You, you still couldn't say Kant wasn't a racist, racist at all because he once said racism is bad, right? You, you would have explained how this goes together with his racist, the racist things he says, right? So I'm, I, I think it would be great for Kant if we have a bit of a principled framework that brings together the imperative to think for yourself and think with others. And to, to, and they can show how this gives us a unified picture in a way, right? So that it's clear that this is not just something Kant says, but something that systematically fits into his, his conception. I, I guess that, that was my underlying point. Um, yeah. No, so I do think it's a fair, I do think it's a fair point, but I'm not sure he doesn't say it, how it can be combined. And this is, for instance, the kingdom of ends. So it's basically for Kant, this is tantamount and at bottom the same. So it's basically, if you try to universalize your maxim, if you try to respect others, it basically means that you abstract from your personal ends and you try to think of a universal standpoint. So a good passage is also this in the second critique, page 87, where he basically explains why, this, why he takes those formulas to be equivalent. And so universalizing tells me um, I shouldn't act on a maxim that you could not also adopt or something. And then he says, this means that I'm not treating you merely as a means because I give you veto power, so to speak. I do not exalt myself above you, but I do give you a voice. And so in this sense, I do think that it might also be in the text. So the trouble is just, um, as we talk with Wojtek at the beginning, it's just that we, we often we see a word like autonomy and then we plug in our contemporary notion and our contemporary notion is very individualistic. But I would say also that when Kant tries to explain his formulas, they're not that individualistic because you're asked to abstract from your personal ends. You're asked to abstract in, um, in a universalizable manner means um, if somebody else couldn't agree to it, you shouldn't go that way and so forth. So it's inherently, I would say community-based. I'm not saying your, your point is incorrect. I do think it's a fair point to make, but it could be that this kind of individualism he's charged with wasn't actually on his mind, wasn't actually something he even took as an opponent, but in the way he writes it, it's, it's already um, try to aim for kingdom of ends, a systematic union where we're all equals and everybody is respected as an equal. Can I follow up or do we have a list of speakers? 
of, of, of other people who want to. So uh, just some a thought that occurred, and I, I agree with almost everything you say, but I wonder, is there an important distinction between impartiality and community? I, I completely agree that the categorical imperative is a way to reason from an impartial perspective. Mm -hmm. Sure. So that it's not individualistic in the sense that it's impartial. Mm -hmm. But I always think that people who stress community don't mean impartiality. Mm -hmm. They mean a specific community, mm -hmm. uh, may, may, maybe your family, your nation, your village, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's more difficult for Kant to incorporate that mm -hmm. because ultimately he wants impartiality or a form of impartiality, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's more difficult for Kant to um, incorporate the wisdom of a specific community, if, if there is such a wisdom. Um, I think that's a challenge for Kant. And one I, that the yeah. imperative does not address all the kingdom of ends. I, I agree. And um, in a way, um, uh, so when Kant thinks about community, community doesn't mean buy from your local farmer. So one specific community um, against each other, be partial and so forth. It, um, in a way, like Nina often emphasizes, it means as a world citizen, as a as a Weltbürger, as um, perpetual peace with all people, with humanity at large, and so forth. And this is, in a way, what I try to say um, in my discussion with our Russian colleague um, in in the audience is basically that. Kant is also important as a corrective and so forth, because this emphasis of community can go too far. And so you can have a community of Nazis, you can, um, and so forth. And this is not a community that is worth preserving. And so um, it's not like that every community just by virtue of, of being a community we should value. And there Kant can, give a corrective without, in a way, pushing an extreme individualism or so forth. So, um, and this um, morality, categorical imperative, dignity, respect, kingdom of ends, they can be a corrective against forms of community that might be dangerous and problematic. Thank you. Спасибо большое, Оливер. А, we have, we, у нас еще один, еще один вопрос, да, Александр Сабанов. Спасибо за лекцию. Я пока не до конца сформулировал еще вопрос, стараюсь как-то на ходу все сопоставить. Да, в качестве предисловия начну с того, у нас сегодня к нам заходил ректор Александр Федоров, он выступил с небольшой речью, тоже он отталкивался сначала вот от доклада Римского клуба, потом упомянул пару книжек, в частности, ту, которую я запомнил, это книга «Шашан и зубов», я скажу по-английски, чтобы ее не перепутать, Uh, the Age of uh, Surveillance Capitalism. Mm. Вот. В частности, uh, в этом контексте он говорил, что uh, uh, Зубов призывает нас быть, uh, в общем-то, и, грубо говоря, отцов, и детей, быть ответственными за те проблемы, uh, экологические катастрофы, которые сейчас разворачиваются. Вот. Но господин Федоров сказал, что он с этим не очень согласен, потому что ответственность можно переложить на детей, потому что у взрослых, кажется, что-то не получилось. Вот. Можно по-разному как бы к этому относиться и не соглашаться с этим. В этом смысле это есть как бы предисловие. Дальше. Я бы хотел еще вернуться к, на вопрос назад, к вопросу Рубена Грандовича Апрессиана, и немножко перевернуть его, что я имею в виду. В данном случае 
вот мы имеем ученое сообщество, естественно, научное сообщество и, грубо говоря, философское. Я бы критиковал, наоборот, философов, а не естественных ученых, потому что, в принципе, у меня нет дела до того, что происходит в их научной дисциплине. Пусть они пользуются любыми понятиями, которые им угодно, я думаю, что я все равно никогда их уже не пойму, что они имеют в виду. Но, тем не менее, для меня, как для философа, некоторое утверждение естественных ученых, вроде того, что, что например, осьминоги чувствуют боль, или что-нибудь вроде этого, надеюсь, вы понимаете, о чем я, представляет для меня, как для философа, некоторую спекулятивную возможность для того, чтобы быть морально открытым не только, например, к человеку. И в данном случае я считаю, вот... То, что было у вас в заключении, когда вы говорите, что отклоняйте обвинения Канта в индивидуализме, рационализме и отсутствии баланса, о котором говорится вот в докладе Римского клуба, есть некое следствие того, что внутри кантовской оптики уже заложен очень сильный антропоцентризм. И в данном случае моральными агентами оказываются только люди. Вот. И я извиняюсь, что мне приходится говорить вот такие вещи, как-то повышая уровень спекуляции с каждым своим вопросом. И уже кажется, что это прям все совсем детское и наивное. Но просто у меня есть ощущение, что не удается сказать что-то что важное, что здесь находится. Поэтому извиняюсь, что... Это граница спекуляции выпала именно на вас, но тем не менее. Можем ли мы, в принципе, мы, люди, разработать какую-то нечеловеческую эпистемологию или нечеловеческую этику? Нечеловеческую не, не антигуманизм, а ингуманизм. Надеюсь, вот так будет понятнее. То есть, вот, в частности, у вас был третий тезис, вот я его вроде прочитал, там вы говорили, что ну, о сцепке разума и чувственности, и нельзя пренебрегать чувственностью. Но я здесь вижу некоторые различия между кантовскими понятиями природы и понятием мира. То есть, когда мы говорим о природе, мы говорим о наполненности природы феноменами. То есть природа, она как бы уже всегда человеческая. А может быть, как бы есть еще некоторые моральные агенты в мире. Потому что, когда мы говорим о мире, мир заполнен не просто феноменами, а вещами. И здесь без разницы, какими вещами. Для нас эти вещи или это любые остальные вещи, о которых мы не можем помыслить. Ну и, собственно, вопрос, как вы думаете, возможно ли расширить поле наших моральных агентов за пределы только лишь человеческого, и вот в данном случае возможно ли какая-то нечеловеческая эпистемология, которая, как мне кажется, вернет обвинения вот в этих трех пунктах, которые были у вас в заключении. Спасибо. Thank you. This is a very interesting um, question. I want to make two points. One is the first one, which I took from both audiences, um, both of my Russian colleagues in the audience. So this is in a way the relation between science and um, philosophy on moral questions. And I think that philosophers have a great deal to contribute even to science. We, first, we talked about that um, 
our ethics should limit um, certain scientific research, but also in a way, if you look at the question is sometimes in psychology, Jonathan Haidt, Joshua Green, is every action motivated by a desire? And if you read the literature in psychology, it just conceptually totally confused because they switch between seven notions of desire. Sometimes desire means a feeling, sometimes it means a goal, sometimes it means a disposition. When they talk about a feeling, it sometimes is a pushing feeling, like you're just you're in love or you're in steroids or you're angry. Sometimes it's more a pulling feeling. You think of your vacation and it gives you um, pleasure. Sometimes they talk about sympathy or just about a mood. And so it just, um, scientists talk about, look, there always is a desire or something, but it's conceptually totally confused. And there they could use a great deal of philosophers to get conceptual clarity. On the second question, it just, I think we can extend it to animals, but it has its limits. So when we extend morality to animals, it's basically we just talk about um, very high forms of animals, dolphins, elephants, maybe chimpanzees, and so forth. And so Franz de Waal, he found certain features of empathy and um, reciprocity, fairness in monkeys at a very high level. But the problem is just that monkeys usually complain about themselves when they are treated unfairly. There's this famous experiment where two monkeys perform the same task and one is rewarded with cucumbers and the other one with grapes. And so the first monkey because grapes are much more desirable, he takes a cucumber and he throws it at the other monkey and the researchers and he's really angry. But usually human beings, we can also complain on behalf of a third party. I can complain if somebody's treated unfairly, although it doesn't have any connection to me. And we don't find this in animals. We find this in at a very high peak, maybe there's a chimpanzee here and there who who does this, but not every animal would um, do this. And so in a way, there's also a second problem and this comes from evolution. So this kind of reciprocity we find in animals, this just gives us two groups of a size of about 150. So if we look in our contact calendars, we have, we know about 150 people. So like in evolution, we are used to being, as Martin pointed out, in communities of, in bands of about 150 people. And we still know about 150 people. But you can't build a city like Moscow or um, Sao Paulo um, or um, in Argentina. You can't build a city on this kind of tit for tat morality. So we find rudimentary forms of um, morality in some animals. And you mentioned the octopus. That's a really good example because an octopus is highly intelligent, but he's not social in the same way that chimpanzees would be. And it's still different from ants and bees and so forth. So we find some elements of morality in um, animals, but it doesn't seem to be quite the same way. Now, it only matters because um, we bring together two questions, and I think we should separate them. So one question is basically, what do we as humans owe to animals? Should we be cruel? Can we be cruel to animals? And there's a question might be no. But the, the other question is basically, do animals have duties? Do animals, um, do I expect that the lion doesn't eat um, the zebra, but goes on a soy diet? And there it might be, no, a lion doesn't have duties in the same way that a human being can have duties. 
But that is a very different question of whether could an animal have rights, meaning should human beings treat animals in a certain way? And I think one can answer this second question, if we can have, um, animals can have rights, we can have obligation to treat animals kindly, although they themselves don't have a duty to act in a certain way. And so um, I think if we focus on the question of um, our duties that animals have rights, we should preserve the environment. From there, it wouldn't follow that um, we have to find morality, the same kind of epistemology in animals as well. Thank you. Спасибо большое. У кого-то еще вопрос? А, вот, да. Еще один вопрос. Ольга, еще есть? Окей, okay. okay. силы еще есть. Спасибо за доклад. Я продолжу самый первый вопрос нашей дискуссии. Вот вы говорите об открытости наук, например, философии и биологии. Но есть пропасть ввиду недоказательности, такой эмпирической, эмпирической недоказательности философии. То есть мы не можем удовлетворить своими ответами биологии. Мы не можем сказать, что вот в мозгу есть отдел, в котором есть категорический императив. Мы не можем этого показать. И вот тем самым нас как бы обзывают не наукой. Вот. Как нам решить эту проблему? Как нам объединить, грубо говоря, биологию и философию? Нужно ли нам создавать новые методологические новую методологию для этих двух дисциплин, которая удовлетворяла бы и биологию, и философию. Как их объединить? Thank you. Yes. So I think it just uh, um, the different questions. So if you want to find out what concretely we should do, we should at look at biology and um, incorporate the sciences. So it might make a great difference if an animal feels pain, for instance, or if it hurts an animal, the way we treat it, its migration patterns and so forth. On the other hand, science can also support the view that there is a categorical imperative. So Kant famously gives the example of the gallows example. This is in the second critique, page 30, 29 to 31. And so it's basically, um, we can make experiments and we can think about, we can construct a thought experiment where no, none of your desires speak in favor of acting morally. And at the same time, you feel that you ought to act morally. And this can show that the categorical imperative is real, it's not just a construction of Kant. Another support that science can give is that Kant's categorical imperative is similar to the golden rule. And we find the golden rule in every culture at every time in ancient Chinese culture, we find the golden rule in the Bible. So it's basically um, by doing comparative anthropology, we can find that categorical imperative is not just an invention of Kant. So we find that basically every culture at every time had some idea of fairness. And on my interpretation, the categorical imperative is very close to an idea of fairness. Kant says, don't make exceptions for yourself just because you are yourself to rules which you believe to be objectively necessary in 424 in the groundwork. And so, um, science, comparative science, can show that there's something to the categorical imperative. And at the same time, when philosophers want to apply the categorical imperative, Kant would say we should look to science. And so I agree with the gist of your question is that both can work together in a way, both should um, look to each other. Um, and like I said to the second question from the audience, I really think philosophers can help scientists to be way more 
clearer and specific in what they're testing. Thank you. Thank you.